Dear ladies and gentlemen, in this talk, I'll present work on microwave quantum networks linking cryogenic systems for superconducting circuit-based quantum computing. The work was done at ETH Zurich by a group of graduate students, including Philip Kurpiers, Paul Magnard, Joshua Scher, Simon Stolz, and Baptiste Troyer. My name is Andreas Walraff. The work has been supported by a European Research Council advanced grant called SuperQNet. On this title slide, you see already the object uh, of this talk. It's a system made of two cryogenic dilution refrigerators, one on the left-hand side in white here and one on the right-hand side, which are connected to each other using a microwave frequency cryogenic link cooled down to 20 millikelvin temperature. And in this work, we were then able to demonstrate that we can transfer quantum information from one chip containing a superconducting qubit to another chip containing a similar superconducting qubit in a spatially separated dilution refrigerator, which is five meters apart from the first one. As usual at this stage, I would like to acknowledge collaborators of our lab, both the former members of our lab at the graduate student and postdoc level, and our collaborators both at ETH and internationally. What are the perspectives for quantum computing with superconducting circuits? Superconducting circuits constitute a viable architecture both for quantum computing and for basic quantum science. A recent highlight includes the demonstration of quantum computational uh, supremacy by the team at Google uh, in the uh, fall of last year. In their experiment, they have actually demonstrated that using uh, about 50 qubits, it was possible for them to perform a computational task, which was way harder to perform on a conventional computer. Indeed, it was impossible for any size conventional computer to solve the identical problem in a meaningful time. So uh, for creating universal quantum computers, however, we will need way more than 50 qubits. So what are the routes towards extending uh, these quantum computing systems to more qubits? One of the approaches could be to add more qubits to the same quantum chip. And currently a number of larger industrial and academic labs are working with a scale of about 100 qubits implemented on the same chip. So a system that is used for operating such a chip is shown here. It's a dilution refrigerator in which wires are routed from room temperature, so from higher stages in the dilution refrigerator to the base temperature plate, where you mount a sample below the base temperature plate and then control its quantum physics, its computations using microwave pulses applied through these cables that you see here. And in these kinds of systems, you can probably easily operate, say, 100 qubits. And if you work a bit at it, you can probably also operate 1,000 qubits in such a system. And so many labs have plans for how to approach uh, this range of number of qubits. However, to go way beyond that, say, to 100,000 qubits or even a million or more, will require major innovations uh, in both the wiring and the cryogenic engineering for these systems. Therefore, it might be an interesting option to think about connecting quantum chips through quantum communication channels. And you could either think to do so in an individual cryogenic system to connect different chips with order 1000 qubits, for example, to each other in the same refrigerator. Or you could think about connecting separate cryogenic systems to each other, which then may house one or several superconducting circuits containing a large number of qubits individually. So a route towards creating a cluster of quantum computers might actually be to have a number of physically uh, separate cryogenic systems and to connect those with cryogenic links to each other to form something like a cluster of quantum computers. And that would be similar to a cluster of processing nodes in high performance computing systems. So what could be different options to realize such quantum networks? Quantum networking technology is established at optical and telecom wavelength, and many demonstrations have been done in this frequency range. 
However, to operate such networks in conjunction with superconducting circuits would require an efficient microwave to optics conversion. So for that to work well, we would require that conversion mechanism to be both efficient, bidirectional, as to realize uh, conversion from microwave to optics and back from optics to microwave. This would need to work at a large enough bandwidth to attain high data rates and also would need to be high fidelity. And developing such conversion systems is an active area of research with lots of recent progress. And here you see just one of the recent papers, which refers to many other works. And if that was possible, this would also allow to potentially transmit quantum information over larger distance between superconducting circuits. A separate approach, though, could be to link superconducting chips to each other through microwave frequency quantum channels. And very recently, there's been a range of uh, progress made in a number of different experiments, which all had in common that they connected different circuit elements or different circuits, either on 2D planar chips or in 3D cavities, to each other in a quantum mechanically coherent fashion by exchanging microwave frequency signals between the components. So this has been demonstrated uh, recently in single dilution refrigerator systems where the chips were connected within the system through cables that uh, reached a length up to a meter or so. However, you could think about connecting cryogenic systems that are separate from each other and each are housing an individual superconducting circuit. And so this would allow one to scale the systems up to a cluster of superconducting electronic circuits and think about applications for quantum information processing, for example. So before I tell you more about our progress in this direction, I'll give you a brief introduction to quantum electronic circuits. So in quantum electronic circuits, you make, you make use of elements such as capacitors and inductors. And you could think about the quantum mechanical states of a single electron on such a capacitor. Namely, the single electron could either be on the lower plate of the capacitor or on the upper plate of the capacitor. And classically, only one of these situations can be realized simultaneously. But quantum mechanically, the electron can be in a superposition of being either at the lower plate of the capacitor or at the upper plate of the capacitor. And I could write that wave function pictorially in the following way. Similarly, if I consider the loop of a wire, I could consider a current flowing clockwise through that loop and generating a magnetic flux phi. The current could also flow counterclockwise through that loop and creating a magnetic flux minus phi. And quantum mechanically, it's in principle possible that there is a superposition of currents flowing both clockwise and counterclockwise, creating a superposition of fluxes phi and minus phi. And again, this I could write as this uh, pictorial superposition state. So in electronic circuits, uh, charge and flux are conjugate variables in a similar way that position and momentum are conjugate variables for particles in free space, for example. So if I write down the total energy or the Hamiltonian of an electronic circuit in terms of its conjugate variables, namely charge and flux, I could then replace these conjugate variables with their corresponding operators to create a Schrodinger equation. And the solutions to this Schrodinger equation give you the energy levels of the electronic circuit. And such I can treat uh, an electronic circuit as a quantum mechanical object. So these uh, Q and phi, which are conjugate variables, also fulfill a commutation relation and thus also an uncertainty relation. And in this way, you can see that any circuit whose dynamics you can express in terms of effective charge and flux operator can be quantized and then used as a quantum mechanical system. So there's two different types of electronic circuits that are abundant in superconducting electronic circuits for quantum information processing. One circuit is a harmonic oscillator, which is a combination of an inductor and a capacitor. And the charges live on the capacitor and fluxes get generated by currents flowing through the inductor. And I can write down the Hamiltonian for this circuit, which is quadratic both in the flux phi and in the charge Q. And such quadratic Hamiltonians describing uh, harmonic oscillators can also be written down in second quantization form. 
And in the second quantization form, it's then obvious that the harmonic oscillator has an energy level spectrum uh, as the one of, a, of any other harmonic oscillator where individual energy levels are equidistantly spaced from each other with an energy that corresponds to Planck's constant times the resonance frequency of the circuit, which is one over the square root of the inductance times the capacitance. If in such a circuit I replace this linear inductor here with the inductance L with a nonlinear inductor realized as a Josephson junction, I can create a circuit that has non-equidistantly spaced energy levels. In this Josephson junction, the magnetic energy is proportional to the cosine of the flux created in the junction by a current flowing through it. This cosinusoidal dependence of the magnetic energy on the flux creates a nonlinearity in the Hamiltonian that in second quantization can be written down in this form. And effectively, the energy level spectrum of this circuit, including a capacitor and a Josephson tunnel junction, is given by a set of energy levels which are now non-equidistantly spaced from each other. And I can identify a ground state and a first excited state, and then a second excited state whose transition frequency is by alpha less than the transition frequency from the ground to first excited state. And this kind of system I can then use as an electronic artificial atom, or when I identify the two lowest energy eigenstates, I can use it as a qubit. So when I think about how to operate these circuits quantum mechanically, I have to consider a number of different aspects. First, I need to be able to control the quantum physics of these circuits, and therefore I connect a microwave source that you see here to the circuit through a capacitor, for example. Similarly, for detecting the quantum state of the circuit, I can couple through another capacitor, for example, a microwave frequency amplifier to the circuit. And then I can think about how I preserve the coherence of such a circuit. And the, there's three elements to that. One is to avoid dissipation. So you use superconducting elements rather than normal metal ones. And if you do so, you can suppress energy relaxation that is due to dissipation in resistive components of the circuit. And if you do so successfully, the only energy relaxation mechanism will be the spontaneous emission due to the coupling of the vacuum fluctuations to the circuit. So a second aspect is the temperature at which you operate the circuit. To be able to operate the circuit in the quantum mechanical ground state, you need to cool it down to temperatures on the order of 10 millikelvin. A typical transition frequency for such a superconducting circuit is around 6 gigahertz. So 6 gigahertz corresponds roughly to 300 millikelvin of thermal energy. So if the circuit is cooled down to 10 millikelvin, it effectively cools into its quantum mechanical ground state. And also you need to be able to control the coupling of the circuit of interest and its quantum behavior to the control circuit and the readout circuitry to preserve the quantum mechanical coherence of this. If you're able to fulfill these three criteria, you'll be able to observe the quantum mechanical properties of these circuits. By now, many labs worldwide do research on the quantum properties of superconducting electronic circuits, both for fundamental science, for research in quantum optics and on hybrid systems, but also for quantum information processing. And in particular, also large companies are now interested in using superconducting circuits for quantum information processing. And these include Google and IBM and Intel, and also startups such as Rigetti. So with superconducting circuits being an interesting contender for realizing quantum information processing systems, we can ask ourselves how we can extend their capabilities by creating quantum links between two millikelvin temperature cryogenic systems. And so here you see a, an, an example of such a system consisting of two cryostats. And what are its desired features? First, we, operate, uh, we want to operate the link between the two cryostats at microwave frequencies. So this link could be realized through either a waveguide at microwave frequencies or a coaxial cable. And if you have a microwave frequency waveguide, you can operate existing gates and protocols between superconducting electronic circuits, now not in the same cryostat, but housed in different cryostats. In addition, you would like to have this cryogenic link to be at millikelvin temperatures, just like the temperatures of the chips that are used within individual cryostats for quantum information processing. When we use low temperature waveguides, 
we can show that they have very low loss. And in fact, the loss is as low as the loss in the best telecom fibers, which we know about as discussed in this paper, for example. And at these low temperatures, essentially, we don't have to deal with thermal background photons. And in addition, it's important that we are able to cool down these cryogenic systems on reasonable timescales. And desirable would be to have these timescales not be so different from cooling the cryostats down individually, which is typically on the order of a day or two. And then if we develop such a solution, we would like to have it extensible so that we can extend the quantum network to either more nodes or to cover longer distances. So here is our concept for realizing such a modular cryogenic network. So we are essentially using a similar approach as you would use in an individual dilution refrigerator, which has an outer vacuum can here shown in blue, then followed by a 50 Kelvin um, radiation shield in the system. Then this is followed by a 4 Kelvin radiation shield and a still temperature radiation shield operating at roughly 800 millikelvin, followed by a base temperature stage, typically somewhere between 10 and 20 millikelvin in temperature. And within this radiation shield at the base stage, then we typically operate quantum processors. And we essentially make use of this uh, nested approach in our quantum link as well. So if you look at a cross section through the quantum link, which we have designed and realized, you see that it has the same elements, vacuum can, 50K shield, 4K shield, still shield, base temperature shield. And now instead of having a chip at the base temperature, we indeed have a 3D aluminum waveguide within this lowest temperature shield. And under these conditions, we actually achieve an insertion loss of about 1 dB per kilometer uh, for, these superconducting, for this superconducting waveguide. So and we have built a system which has these features. And uh, here you see a cross section of uh, one of the link elements that we've actually constructed. In gray, you see the vacuum can. And then in uh, uh, copper color, the different copper shields. And within the innermost copper shield, you see an aluminum waveguide that uh, um, passes along the center of the apparatus. And in our modular and extensible cryogenic uh, microwave quantum network architecture, we can put together different link modules to bridge larger distances. Here you see an example of two cryostats that are separated by roughly five meters with three link elements, two shorter ones which connect to the cryostats directly and one longer link module which covers a, a separation of about two and a half meters in the center. So what were the main technical challenges in realizing such a system? So for one, you want to maximize the conductive transport of heat along each one of the stages. Then you want to minimize the radiative heat load between the stages and ensure that everything is mechanically stably supported without creating uh, additional heat load. And we also have to take care of the mechanical contra contractions that occur when we cool down the whole system from initially room temperature to the operation temperature of close to absolute zero. So we've successfully addressed all these technical challenges and built a system. And because of its modular nature, we can not only build a, a certain length, but we can extend that length. And we've used those capabilities to both construct five meter cryogenic links, but also 10 meter cryogenic links. So here you see a picture of a 10 meter system that we've set up in our lab at the beginning of 2019. So on the left hand side, you see one of our cryostats and on the right hand side, the other cryostat and the two cryostats are connected to each other by a 10 meter long microwave frequency cryogenic link. And this system we've operated successfully and cooled down to base temperature and characterized its properties. So what you see on this slide is uh, our measurements of the different temperature stages of this whole system versus the position inside the system. So what we see here is that the highest temperatures are realized in the center of the link, where on the 50 K shield, we have essentially 70 Kelvin temperature. And then the temperature reduces towards the coolers to a temperature scale of about uh, uh, 40 to 45 Kelvin. And this can be understood by considering the heat that flows from, this, from the center of the cryogenic link uh, towards the cooling points realized by the cryostats. And the temperature profile can be understood when you consider the cooling power, the heat load on the system, and the thermal conductivity as set by the materials. 
And this gives us the temperature profile, which we've plotted here, which we can also simulate and understand in this way. When we look at the temperature profile at the four Kelvin temperature stage, we get the following results, where we see that all parts of it are at temperatures lower than four and a half Kelvin about. And also the still stage reaches temperatures well below uh, one Kelvin everywhere. And this allows us then to reach a base temperature along the 10 meter long link, where the maximum temperature is roughly 22 millikelvin at the hottest point. And cooling down the system from room temperature to this temperature takes about three and a half days. So instead of using this uh, long 10 meter system for our initial quantum physics experiments, we decided to reduce the length uh, and to realize a five meter long cryogenic link for performing quantum experiments. And the main reason for that was that the, the long system was just inconvenient in our lab because it was interfering with some of the other cryogenic setups. But in principle, we are confident that we could do any of these experiments over much longer distances. So here you see a picture of this, uh, um, a conceptual picture of the cryogenic link. In one of the cryostats, we house one chip that acts as an emitter and a second chip in the other cryostat acting as a receiver. And the two chips are connected to each other by a long waveguide system uh, connected through a circulator uh, to the second chip. So here you see a picture of one of the chips. Uh, the chip has an individual qubit. It has a readout resonator with a Purcell filter for performing a high fidelity readout of one of the qubits. And then there's a transfer resonator, which we can use to map the qubit state into the transfer resonator and then release that state into the waveguide and propagate it towards the second setup. And doing so, we can actually transfer quantum states between the two circuits. So we do that by, in a controlled way, emitting a photon from the, from the sender of the quantum information. And this gets done in the following way. So say if we want to transfer an excited qubit state, we first map the sender qubit uh, to its second excited state by two pi pulses that are indicated here. And then we apply an amplitude and phase modulated transfer pulse that moves that excitation from the qubit into a photon into the transfer resonator. And that photon then releases at a rate kappa its excitation into the waveguide. And there the photon travels from the sender towards the receiver. And to verify that this process happens according to our plans, we actually interrupt this transfer pulse g of t, g tilde of t, at a given time that is indicated here along this time axis. And when we interrupt that pulse, we can measure with the readout resonator the population of our qubit, both in the f state, in the e state, and in the g state. And as the pulse length progressively gets longer, we see that we effectively transfer all occupation from the excited state into the ground state of the qubit. And in this way, we create a photon in the waveguide, which we can then absorb at the receiving end. And this absorption essentially is realized by applying a similar transfer pulse as this G of T pulse, but in reverse at the second qubit to, in the same way as we emit the photon here, reabsorb the photon at the second qubit. So, and what does that result into? So here you see again our five meter link one chip in the left cryostat, one chip in the right cryostat. We create a photon in the quantum link in a controlled fashion and then reabsorb it at the second chip. And for that, we run this protocol where in the emitter A and the receiver B, this pulse sequence shown here is executed. To test this quantum state transfer protocol, we actually prepare qubit A at the emission site sequentially in six mutually unbiased input states. Transfer that state into a photon and reabsorb it uh, at the receiver, qubit B. And there we perform quantum state tomography on qubit B after the state transfer. And with that information, we can actually infer the process matrix that describes the transfer of quantum information from the emitter to the receiver, from qubit A to qubit B. And this you see here, and ideally we would expect that transfer matrix to be an identity matrix. And the deviations from the identity matrix actually give us uh, an idea about the fidelity of this process. And evaluating this fidelity, we see that we can transfer this quantum state with a fidelity of about 80%. 
And uh, we can understand that fidelity to a high degree uh, using master equation simulations in which we take account of all the, uh, un all the known um, infidelities and losses in the system. And, uh, and these allow us to improve future versions of the system. So the state transfer fidelity is around 80%. Here. So we can use the same approach to create entanglement between chips in the two different cryostats over this linear distance of five meters using a similar approach. Again, we run a pulse sequence between the emitter and the receiver, and this pulse sequence is realized to create a belt state between the emitter qubit, which is the first item in this uh, wave function, and the receiver qubit, which is the second item. And here we consider the Psi plus belt state. And uh, doing this protocol, we can analyze the, the two qubit state, which we have created this way. And there's a two qubit density matrix, which is shown here, and a two qubit poly sets that correspond to the spell states. And the uh, difference between the realized belt state and the ideal belt state gives us the fidelity for this two qubit entangled state. And again, this fidelity here is uh, about 80%, showing that we can faithfully entangle qubits that are housed in two separate cryostats. And you can also evaluate other entanglement measures such as the concurrence uh, for this system. And as before, also in this instance, we understand the dynamics of the system very well and can extract from that data the infidelities and identify different contributions to it, such as decoherence and loss along the channel. So to summarize at this stage, I would like to say that we've realized cryogenic links between two dilution refrigerators separated by either five or 10 meters. Both systems have reached temperatures below 22 millikelvin in the middle of the link. And the operating five meter system has allowed us to demonstrate quantum state transfer and entanglement generation protocols between two qubits across five meter linear distance with 80% fidelity each. And in the future, we think of extending the distance to explore non-local physics in this setup. And we also plan to perform multi-qubit experiments across the quantum link. And for that, we have acquired a new European Union FET open project, which is called Super QLAN. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and want to point out that we're always looking for excellent graduate students and postdocs and technical staff to join our efforts. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you very much.